How would you like to do church like Jesus did? Over the past few years, we've learned that church can happen in a very meaningful way outside of a church building. In fact, we're getting raving reviews from our house churches, which are now over 100. Though I thank God for churches in buildings and on campuses, God is leading more and more people these days to gather for church in their homes. Not only is it easier for many people to attend a house church, but a house church can offer a level of community that campuses can't. Well, I'm excited to announce that every Thursday in December and January, I plan to host a house church interest meeting on Zoom at 5 o'clock p.m. Pacific time. If you're not attending a church right now and are interested, or if you know of anyone who's interested, then all they have to do is email us at hcinfo at solidlives.com or click the link in the description of this video. Okay, now let me welcome you to the New Testament Daily with Jerry Dearman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. I'd appreciate it if you'd help others find this resource by sharing the link, and if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. Okay, now let's pray, and we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you for the Word of God. Thank you that it's inspired. I pray that each person watching or listening today will hear what you have to say to them through your Word. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, here we go. Chapter 4 of 1 John. Here's what it says. Beloved, so this is talking to believers. Beloved, do not believe every spirit but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Well, let's just stop there and take note of a couple of things. First of all, John is saying test spirits, test spirits. Well, he's acknowledging that there are spirits, but he's saying test them. Well, why test them? Because not all of the spirits that you will encounter or may encounter are of God. Well, in the spirit realm, there are spirits on both sides, God's side and the devil's side. On the devil's side, there's the devil himself, of course, but then all the demonic spirits. But on God's side, side there are all of the angelic beings, various kinds, seraphim, cherubim. Uh, there are angels that look just like men, not with wings, but the Bible would call them men. The book of Hebrews uh, says, uh, when you entertain strangers, you may be entertaining angels without being aware of it. And uh, this is very common in the Bible where they would call angels men, like the three men that came to Abraham. One of them was God and two of them were angels, the angels that were sent to Sodom and Gomorrah. And so uh, these are all spirits. Of course, God is spirit. Jesus was spirit until he became a human being, but now he has a human body, a glorified body nonetheless. But notice this, he says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Well, he didn't say don't believe any spirit. He said don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. Well, if you just stop right there, you would get the impression that this is if a spirit presented himself to you. In other words, you saw this vision, you saw a spirit, and the spirit may be pretending to be an angel, or it may really be an angel, for example. But notice he goes on to say, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Many false prophets. So, in other words, he's not only talking about seeing uh, into the spirit realm, seeing a vision of an angel or a demon or whatever. He's talking also about human beings who would speak by supposedly the Holy Spirit, but he's saying you have to test to see whether what they're saying is actually from the Holy Spirit of God or from a spirit who is not from God. And he's going to show us how we test this, okay? So notice this. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Verse 2, By this you know the Spirit of God is the person speaking by the Spirit of God, or is the Spirit that you're seeing a vision of, for example, speaking by the Spirit of God. He said, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh 
is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. So I want you to notice here something that is often overlooked. John is letting us know the way that you can tell whether the spirit is from the spirit of God or whether the spirit is from the enemy, Satan's kingdom of darkness, is not by what they look like, not by how muscular, not by how tall, not by what, you know, shining bright clothes they're wearing, or even the sound of their voice. No, the way that you judge spirits is by simply what they say. What did they say? See, we're, we judge spirits based on the truth of the word of God. So John gives this example and says, look, if a spirit says that Jesus has come in the flesh, John says is saying to us, listen, no demonic spirit is going to confess that. Uh, they want to deny that that the Son of God came and became a human being and such. He said, but if the Spirit is denying it and saying that he didn't come in the flesh, well, now you know. You've been tipped off. So it doesn't matter who the person is through whom the Spirit would be speaking, for example. Uh, or, and when I say that, I don't necessarily mean in a demonic voice. Uh, I'm talking about somebody trying to prophesy or saying that they're speaking on behalf of God. And so John is saying, here's how you can tell by which spirit they're speaking. And of course, it could be a, a vision of a spirit as well. And we also should point out that Paul said to the Corinthians that even Satan himself can transform himself into an angel of light. So demon spirits and Satan himself are deceivers. And so that's why you cannot go by what the person looks like, what the being looks like, uh, whether they sound like God or whatever, we have to listen to what they say. Does what they say line up with the truth of Scripture? If not, then we have to uh, assert, we have to judge, even if it appeared to be Jesus himself speaking. If what so the so-called Jesus spirit was saying did not line up with the word of God, then you have to not accept that as being Jesus. This is hard for some people, but this is what John is saying. This is what the Bible teaches us. The word of God is the final authority. In other words, this is what God said. We don't know if this being that we're seeing or if this spirit by which a person is prophesying is really of God, except for whether or not it lines up with the word of God. Okay, so verse 3, And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Notice John didn't say the Antichrist was already in the world way back in the first century. He said the spirit of Antichrist was already in the world. Verse 4, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. This was very popular many years ago from the King James Bible. Greater is he who is in you than he who that is in the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. But here the New King James, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So John is saying, look, you've already overcome these demonic spirits. And the reason you have is because if you're born again, the Holy Spirit is inside of you. And he who is in you is greater than he who is of the world and in the world. In other words, you won't be deceived because the Holy Spirit, even through what we're learning right now with these Holy Spirit inspired words from John. The Holy Spirit will tip you off and help you to judge and discern how to pick off these deceptions from the enemy. Okay, let's come down now to verse 5. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. Verse 6. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the Spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So John is saying, look, uh, different people have different spirits inside their heart. Somebody who's born again by the spirit of God is going to hear and the words of God are going to resonate with that person's spirit. 
But a person that has not been born again or yet been born again, well, that person, when you're trying to speak by the Spirit of God, it may not make sense to them. They Their spirit's still in darkness. So he's saying you can tell the Spirit of God and the Spirit of error or somebody who is not yet born of the Spirit of God because they're not going to understand your words if you're speaking from the Word because they're not born again. And their words are not going to bear witness with you because they're incompatible. Like Paul said to the Corinthians, what fellowship has light with darkness? See? So now let's come down to the eighth verse. We are of God. He who knows God hears us, and he who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Okay, that was uh, a repeat. Verse 7. Beloved, here we go. These are the famous two verses that I told you about. Beloved, let us love one another. Well, by saying beloved, he's talking about the family of God. Yes, we need to love everybody in the world, but there's a premium on loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. So beloved, let us love one another for, watch this, love is of God and everyone who loves, watch this, is number one, born of God and number two, knows God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Now watch this. He who does not love does not know God. Notice it doesn't say who he who does not love is not born of God because you can have a born again believer who's still immature and still needs to grow in his maturity in the Lord and is still somewhat selfish and self-centered. See, and so they're not uh, acting in love very often. That doesn't mean that they're not necessarily born of God. But John says, but you don't know him because when you know him, you know love. In fact, listen to what he's saying. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. When you really get to know God, you're really getting to know love, and that love rubs off on you. And you want to love other people the way that God loves you. So God is love, not just has love, not just expresses love, but God is love love. Verse 9, in this the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. That sounds a lot like John three sixteen. Well, it's the same author, uh, the apostle John. Verse 10, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the sacrificial substitute for our sins. So this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. We got to get that straight. Uh, we didn't initiate the love. It is God who initiated the love toward us. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Oh, that's a big statement. If God loved us, and he says, if God so loved us, let's say it this way. If God loved us so much, then we also ought to love one another. Verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. Sounds a lot like what Paul said in Romans 8, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Verse 14, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. We've seen and testify. See, John was with Jesus, and he saw him do the miracles, and he watched him walk on water, and he watched him die on the cross, and he saw him raised from the dead and such. So John is saying, look, we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Verse 15, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he and God. Notice he didn't say whoever confessed, whoever said a prayer one time. No, he said whoever confesses. This is their, this is what they talk about. This is what they affirm on a regular basis. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he and God. Verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. So he says it again. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So John is saying it's, it, they're interchangeable because God is love and therefore love is God. 
And so when you abide in love, you're abiding in God. When you're abiding in God, you're abiding in love. And he's talking about true love. You know, we have a statement uh, today, love is love. Well, you know, the word love can represent many different types of attractions and, and so on. In fact, in the Greek New, Te New Testament, there are multiple words that we would translate love, but they mean different things. See, but pure love that we're talking about here, agape, agape, unconditional love. This is the God kind of love. And it's different than other kinds of maybe affections that we have or even lust that we sometimes call love. But this is pure, undefiled, unconditional love that God is and has for us. Verse 17, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Did you know that if you'll walk in love with people right now in this life, you'll have boldness in the day that you stand before the Lord Jesus? But did you know you can obey in every other thing? But if you are not walking in love with people now, then you're, you're not going to be bold in the day because you're going to be in the presence of love and you're going to realize that you did not walk in love. And so love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. We should be walking like him. We have the ability. We have the Spirit of God. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And we have Jesus and his love for us to be the example, along with, of course, Father God's love. Verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. You know, I think about a horrible scenario, but it gives a good illustration of there is no fear in love and perfect love casts out fear. But you think about, say, uh, a family that went to the Grand Canyon and uh, say, uh, I don't know that there is a place like this. I would think there is, but say there's a cliff. I mean, a, a high cliff of the Grand Canyon and there's no rail in this particular place. There's nothing to hold somebody back. And here's a little two-year-old that's tottering toward the edge of the cliff and the mother sees him and she takes off at a full sprint straight toward the cliff to reach her son. Now, she's not thinking about herself. She's not afraid. She would never run toward the cliff like that if it wasn't for this situation. But because of her love for her son, she is so not afraid of, for herself. She's only thinking about him. And that love just throws out all the fear. And she does what she normally would not do, run straight toward the cliff to grab him and to bring him back. And so there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. When you're walking in love with people, you forget about yourself. You forget you're not tormented about fear because you're so uh, paying attention to blessing and loving somebody else. So it goes on to say, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. I mean, that's so simple. We love him because he first loved us. Let's always keep that straight and not uh, get the idea that we're doing God a favor by loving him. Oh, no. We're only responding to his magnificent, overwhelming, unconditional love. Okay, verse 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Oh, we have to ingest this and just admit, if I'm not loving my brother, somebody that might annoy me or irritate me or bother me or rub me the wrong way or maybe even really uh, offended and hurt me, oh, but I may not trust them with everything, but if I can't love them whom I see, how am I going to love God whom I don't see? Verse 21, and this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. He who loves God must love his brother also. So this is not an option. God is love. If we're going to serve God, know God, love God, obey God, we must also love one another with the love of our God. What a beautiful chapter. We have one more to go in this wonderful little book of First John.